Okay, hi. I'm, I'm Annie. It's really great to be here. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about my journey into, in, into technology through learning InSpec. And, oh, my clicker's not working. Sorry. There we go. My name is Annie Hedgepeth. I'm a cloud automation engineer at 10th Magnitude. And today I'm going to be sharing, you, sharing with you about my journey because I want you to be thinking of ways in which you too can help bring people into technology that may not have uh, thought about it before. So first though, my journey begins, oh it cut off the bottom, my journey begins in a movie theater. So does anyone know what this movie is? It's There Will Be Blood. Has anyone seen that? It came out about 10 years ago. It was up for like a bazillion Academy Awards. And that's Daniel Day-Lewis. And I was a casting director. I have a, a degree in film. And casting was the first career right out of college. And so at the time, I had been working in it several years. And I was pregnant. And so I was going to be staying home for a little while. And this was the very last film that I worked on. And so I was a casting director in Dallas, OK? And you don't get Academy Award winning movies coming across your desk in Dallas very often. You get a lot of horror movies or reality TV or commercials or things like that. So when I read this script, I didn't know who was acting it. I didn't, I didn't know who the director was. But um, I knew it was so good because I hadn't read a script like this before. So I was so excited about working on it. And when you do casting, there's the Hollywood casting directors, and then there's the local ones. So anybody that is hired on locally, uh, because the film was shot in Texas, so that was who I cast, the local people, and extras and things like that. So anyway, um, I worked really hard on it, drove all the way out to Marfa, Texas, which is an eight-hour drive that you can't fly to, and we searched high and low for the, the little boy in the movie who was a really big role. Anyway. All this to say, it was a lot of work, but so rewarding and so amazing. So like a year and a half later, it finally comes out into the movies. And my husband and I are sitting there in the movie theater. And if you have any friends in film, you know that if they worked on the film, you sit through the credits. Because that's like your one glory, right, is the credit. And so I don't know if you can see this, but my name is Annie. And there's not an Annie on there. I did not get a credit. I was heartbroken. I had just put my blood, sweat, and tears into that film, and I did not get a credit. But look, my boss got a credit, my colleague got a credit, the medics got a credit, and <laughs> I did not. So, oh, I'm sorry, I hit my microphone. So, um, it gave me really good information, though. It told me that as a creative type, I wasn't really that creative in my job choice because I chose something that everybody that looked like me had chosen, right? Um, and so I realized that it might be time to think about something different, something where I can add a little bit more value with the characteristics that I have instead of going into an industry that is really oversaturated with people that are just like me. So. Um, Oh, and that's what this is, the long tail career. So it's, this is like film and music and art and writing and all of these things. A handful of the people make most of the money, while the vast majority of the people just do it for the glory of it all, right? Because they're not getting paid as much. And so that's what a lot of creative people do, and it's not very creative, right? So after that, I... Uh, <laughs> I was doing a lot of home decorating and stuff, and I did a lot of woodworking and things like that. And so there was this one Christmas market in particular where I made a bunch of like reclaimed wood art and things like that. And um, if you've done any woodworking at all, you know that it's like a lot of just dirty work in the garage and whatnot. And so I worked my butt off for weeks preparing for this Christmas market. and. The booth behind me, and so I'm, I'm all set up in my booth, I'm ready, um, I feel very proud of my artisan work and whatnot, and the booth behind me was selling um, this notebook of crockpot recipes. They had 
downloaded it from the internet or something. I don't even think that they made it up. They just like printed out a PDF, put it in a notebook, sold them for $10 each, and they sold out. They sold 50 of them in like an hour, and they left. And yet, my stuff didn't get sold, and I was so frustrated. Well, I mean, some of it got sold, but not as much. But I was frustrated because I was really in competition with like big mass producers, right? Like a lot of this stuff was being sold at like Pier One or whatever else. And so, um, so that gave me more information. Like, why do I keep choosing these careers that are um, oversaturated or not valued or whatever? I really need to be being more creative. Like, I should have learned this by now, right? But I hadn't. So I was ready to really start getting back into full-time work because most of that had been sort of entrepreneurial and home business and stuff like that. But um, all three of my kids were going to be starting school this past August. And for the first time, all of them would be in school. And so I was like, I need to get back into full-time work. So, but what am I going to do? I keep on choosing these long-tail careers, and I'm tired of the long-tail career. I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, and so I thought, well, maybe I just need to go back to school. Maybe I need to get my MBA. And so on April 18th, oh, it's cutting it off. On April 18th, I took my GMAT. And uh, that, so, okay, that told me two things. Number one, it told me I did not want to study for another two years and be in school. I'm sorry. Like, I'm sure it's really rewarding and fantastic, but... It just, in the place that I'm at in life right now, I didn't want to do that. Um, and I was just kind of chomping at the bit, too, just to get out there and have a career. And so I didn't want to wait another two years. I was too anxious and too ready. The other thing that it told me, though, is that I could learn again, right? Like, uh, Linda Rising, I don't know if you've ever heard of her. I really highly recommend listening to one of her talks on agile thinking, on the agile mindset. She says you can learn at any age. You're not either smart or not smart. You can, but you can grow and learn in anything. And so I really took that to heart. And like I learned math again. And I had always told myself that I just wasn't good at math, but I was able to, um, to do, to study all of the things that were in the GMAT for math and like, uh, for math and actually learn it. And so that was really a confidence booster in just that uh, I could learn again. So that was April 18th, but then April 19th, the very next day, um, I had an interview because I also figured, well, you know, if, if, uh, if I don't want to go back to school, maybe I should just get out there and start doing some interviews and whatnot, and I haven't done an interview in a really long time. It'll be good practice and whatnot. So I had an interview with this guy. <laughs> There's a reason his face is blurred out. Um, so, <laughs> but that really is him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it says LinkedIn. Um, it was for an account management position. And uh, first of all, I was so excited about it. I was, you know, in a suit for the first time in a really long time. Um, they bring me in and they seat me at this huge boardroom table that was seriously about this long and probably two meters wide. And it's, and it's probably this tall too. And I'm in this huge chair and I'm not that big of a person, and so I sit in it, and I'm like a little mouse down there like this, like trying to see over it. And um, so already I'm feeling a little insecure because of the enormity of everything. And he sits way across from me, and I'm ready to tell him you know, everything that I can do and how my skills from casting can you know, transfer over into this career and blah, 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 blah. And so, um, but somehow it comes up that I had kids, and... And he kept on saying stuff like, oh man, I don't know how I could do my job with kids. That just, ooh, that seems really hard. It's a lot of, I just travel a lot and it's a lot of long hours and ooh, I don't know. And I was thinking, well, no, it's totally fine. I was telling him, no, it's totally fine. You know, for the past 10 years, we focused on my husband's career and now we've said that we're going to focus on my career. And so, yeah, we've got it under control, no problem. Um, I actually like traveling. Uh, but he just kept on going back to it, and it was kind of frustrating because I couldn't tell him. He wasn't allowing me really to tell him what value I could bring to the company. He was more focused on what I, on what he perceived that I couldn't do. And also, honestly, at the time, my resume didn't look very good because I had been out of full-time work for quite a while. <coughs> Excuse me. So I leave there, and as I walk out, there's somebody 
in the waiting room that's probably 15 years younger than me and beautiful. And I thought, oh, she's totally getting the job. So I get in the car and I'm frustrated and mad, not because like he pointed out the kid thing, but because uh, he just didn't allow me to show the value that I could bring. And I was frustrated because I knew what kind of value I could bring, but he wasn't interested in hearing it, I guess. So anyway, that was a good experience for me though because it showed me again that I'm definitely not gonna get a job on my, res on my resume right now because it's not that great. So um, that was April 19th, okay? So now we're in April, May. Um, and in, on April 21st, I made my first GitHub commit. I had never even, I didn't, didn't even know what Git was. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, I was frustrated and like at the end of my rope. And so I said, well, I am just, maybe I'll just transfer my, maybe I'll take my, um, my decorating website and host it on GitHub pages or something like that. I was just kind of getting my feet wet and, and maybe figuring out if that was something that I wanted to do. So that was my very, April 21st of last year was my very first Git commit. So then on April 25th, that was just a few days later, these two guys, okay, so the guy on the very right is my husband, and these two other guys came over for dinner, and that's Christoph Hartman and Dominic Richter, and they're the two creators of the framework called Inspect that is a um, uh, security and compliance auditing framework. So that dinner was a really kind of special dinner at my house, though, because my husband works for a large POS company, and he was, he brought this huge DevOps initiative to his company and it was uh, a year long struggle though that he had with his security and compliance team because he was wanting to automate all of the things and bring velocity and all of this stuff but security was his blocker and he would come home frustrated every day and just say, oh they're so, um, they just say no to everything and they're so frustrating and I would tell him, hey, you know, what do they need? They, they're just trying to do their job, right? Like they're not saying no just to be mean. They're saying no because, you know, if your company totally gets owned, then it's on them, right? Like they've got a really big responsibility. And um, so they're just, they err on the side of caution for a good reason. And so anyway, a year of this though, right? And so I keep on telling him, what do they need? Um, figure that out. And what can you do for them? And you know, things like that. Build empathy, yada, yada. And so finally he discovers Inspec and he shows it to his security and compliance team. And he was able to see his infrastructure as code and now security compliance could see their compliance as code and they could automate all of their compliance now. And so, um, and there he is right now. So, <laughs> help yourself. Um, so anyway, it was really cool to see how uh, they could um, come together and at this dinner, it was really kind of like this beautiful expression of empathy in the workplace and, and how this tool, Inspect, really solved their problems and really brought about empathy within their organization and now they're able to move with greater velocity. And so it's really kind of uh, beautiful. So anyway, after that dinner, we were literally doing the dishes, picking up after the dinner, and Michael said, why don't you learn how to do inspect? And I thought he was crazy. I was like, okay, I, I keep touching my microphone. I'm so sorry. So sorry for whoever is hearing the recording. Um, anyway, I said, you are crazy. I am not technical. I'm an art person. I don't do that. That's crazy. Um, but he said, you know what? I mean, it was written so that security and compliance people could, uh, could write it because they're not normally coders. And so if you learn this, then you could help prove whether or not it's really true, whether or not their claims are true. And you know, if you're wrong, then you can just say, well, I guess a person with a non-technical background can't do it. So what do you have to lose? Give it three weeks. And if you totally hate it, never do it again. And I said, okay, fine. I can do anything for three weeks. I'll do that. Um, and so I did. So 
my question for you is to consider uh, if you want somebody to, or if somebody is considering a career in technology, a major career switch, change, then how can, you, how can you convince them to give you three weeks? What problems can they solve for you? So the problem that InSpec had at the time was that there was very little documentation on it, and like that was one thing that I was good at, was, was blogging and writing, and so that was a problem that I could solve. And also, the people at my, at my husband's company, they needed to get up to speed with InSpec, and still, they didn't have anything, so I was able to solve a problem for his company as well. So, okay, so now we're still looking at like April, May, and at that same time, I was thinking, okay, if I'm gonna do a career change, I need to do some networking, and so, very sort of nervously, I sent this email, this is the exact email, to the DevOps Days Dallas organizing team, and I said, hey, um, this guy, Doug Ireton, he wrote a blog post about uh, encouraging women in DevOps, and they, he said that a good idea is to have, uh, is to invite women to volunteer for the DevOps organizing team, DevOps Days organizing team, and so, anyway, if you need me to help, I can do that. And so, that was at 3.41, PM and six minutes later they said absolutely <laughs> and so I was like oh what did I have to worry about so anyway this was my first sort of instance of somebody loaning me their privilege so this man named Anwan Simmons and I'm afraid that it's cut off Anwan Simmons though he gives a talk called lending privilege and he talks about how if you have a platform if you have any sort of privilege then uh, you can loan it to other people and then that can give them a boost up and help them in their, in their journey. And so that's what the good people at DevOps Days Dallas did for me. They loaned me their privilege, their platform, so that I then could have something to stand on. Um, and many people along the way did that. This was just the first thing in technology that I had somebody do that for me. So that was really, really cool. So then now we're looking at May and uh, I started a blog. And this was the one that I told you about that was doing the tutorials for InSpec. And so my first Jekyll commit was on May 1st. Oh, so yeah, I was reading that right there. But um, So I used GitHub pages to host a Jekyll template website. And so it was really cool because super simple, right? But it was something that kind of lowered the barrier to entry for me. So I learned Markdown, which really super simple, right? But for somebody that doesn't have a background in technology, it was like, oh wow, I don't have to use WordPress anymore, so this is fantastic. I can make it exactly the way I want it to look. And, and so I learned um, how to use Visual Studio Code, never done that before. I had never even opened a terminal before. And so now I'm learning Bash to, to do my Git commits and whatnot. Um, and then Chef and Inspec, of course, because I was learning Inspec for the tutorials, and then I learned how to remediate with Chef. And so it just kind of snowballs, and you just learn little by little. Uh, I think sometimes we can get overwhelmed by thinking that you have to know everything about everything, but really, if you just kind of start small and, and uh, learn those things really well, then you can grow off of that. So, okay, so another really cool thing that happened was that uh, Christoph, one of the InSpec guys, had started inviting me and Michael to meet with him weekly and to discuss InSpec. And so that was really another uh, instance of somebody loaning me their privilege. So it was valuable for him because he got to see how I saw InSpec through the eyes of somebody not technical, from the eyes of somebody who does, doesn't code. And then it was valuable with Michael because uh, my husband, because uh, Christoph could see how he was using it in his large corporation. So anyway, and then the value that I could um, bring him also was the tutorials and things like that. And he was—he never asked me to like write anything, but I was glad to do it because it was such um, a good experiment for me. It was just really fun to kind of discover it along the way. So. I, so these are the questions that I have for you. So what is so if you have somebody that you're apprenticing or mentoring or whatever, what are they excited about working on? So I was really excited about um, the control that that this small amount of of coding that I started doing gave me. It was really fun, but I was also excited about writing and communicating and blogging. And so like not everybody starting out, not everybody that's you know switching from a creative job to tech to technology. Um, should start a blog or should do whatever I'm doing. Like the, you have to kind of find out what this person is really excited about. And then 
create a sense of urgency. So like when I started meeting with Christoph, I started feeling this like sense of urgency to um, produce something good. And then I put it out on Twitter that I, that I had this blog about InSpec. And so then I kind of felt like this uh, sense of obligation to, to keep going with it. And so I kind of created this own sense of urgency for myself just so that I would have some accountability to keep on going. And then something that, I'll, that I keep on saying throughout this talk is how can you lend your privilege and who do you want to lend it to? Uh, everybody in this room has some amount of privilege and a platform that you can loan to somebody else in order to give them the, the boost that they need. And the other thing I love talking about is inverted learning. So something that I learned along the way was this concept of inverted learning and how you can discover a technology from the outside in. So I didn't have a whole lot of base experience, but the way that I learned everything was sort of from the outside in. So I'll show you how that means. <clears throat> and somebody named Wes Higby uh, taught a couple of Pluralsight courses that I took, one on Docker and one on Jenkins. And he talks about this concept also with Docker about how you can learn software kind of invertedly as well. So anyway, so it was an original thought. It came from Wes Higby. Okay, so does anyone know what this one? Does anyone not know what this is, or does anyone know what this is? What is it? CIS. It's a CIS uh, auditing benchmark, I guess. CIS benchmark. So, if anyone has um, ever had to do any CIS auditing, you'll know that you get this big CIS benchmark PDF or something, and this is just one one control, and so you have this whole book of them, right? And I was talking to um, a security friend of mine and he said that they would just go through this, this PDF once a year. I was like, once a year? That doesn't seem very safe. Uh, okay. And he said that it would take them about two weeks. They would do it all manually. And, and like coming from my perspective, like I, I don't have what you guys have, right? This like history of being in technology where you did do everything the slow, painful way, right? For me, it's always been like DevOps and automation. And so I was like... Why? What? What? I was so confused. And so, anyway, I was like, let me show you what Inspect does. And so, this is that same exact control in Inspect. So, I'll go back. Okay, so you can see, oh, my clicker. All right, so level one, that just means, uh, you know, it's maybe not something that you have to prioritize really highly. Um, Description, set owner and group of etsygrab.conf to root user. Okay, so that's what you're gonna do. And then rationale, this is why. So you're doing this because it prevents non-users from changing the file. Okay, that's your reason. And so you're gonna do this audit to see if, if you're in compliance. And if you're not, then um, it gives you this remediation command down here that you can't see, because it cut it off. So, okay. So inspect is the exact same thing in this code that's totally human readable. So there's your title, there's your impact. So this really, I talk about how this builds empathy because right here with the title and with the title, it's telling your compliance auditor, um, hey, look, this one is straight from the CIS pro, uh, benchmark and it's getting tested. Don't worry about it. And then this one, the description, it's telling your developer or whoever is creating this. This is why you're doing this, okay? Your security and compliance person isn't crazy, that, but we just need to do this because, um, oh, that one doesn't say it. Well, I need to change my slide, don't I? Um, anyway, you're doing this because, you know, it needs to be this way. And so then describe file, there's your file. Its owner should equal root, its group should equal root. So simple and so easily readable. My, my 10 year old could, could understand that. Um, and so then, okay, so I showed my uh, security and compliance friend this, the entire profile of, of all of this that I had on GitHub. I said, look, I just made this whole profile of all these CIS audits, and I think it's for an Ubuntu machine. And um, I'm gonna go spin, I'm gonna go onto the Azure portal, and I'm gonna spin up a, an Ubuntu machine real fast. And then I'm gonna take that profile that's in GitHub right now, just in my, in my account, and I'm gonna run it uh, on an SSH because Inspect doesn't need to be installed on the nodes. It just needs to be installed on your on whatever you're testing it on. So it was on my local machine. So I did an Inspect exec and then my GitHub account and then SSH into the into the machine. And so 
I get this output right away that's something like this, but with some more errors and stuff, and, or some more failures, rather. And I was like, look, I just did that in like five seconds. <laughs> like, don't you wish you had that? And he was like, really, seriously, yes, I do. Like, that would have saved so much time. And so the point is that now you can focus more on higher level things because you don't have to worry about all these little audits anymore, but you can really sort of focus on like, you know, zero day things, zero, zero day stuff, or like, um, you know, major security issues and not this. You can automate it. So, oh, and then, and then I was learning Chef also because I would then go back and remediate with Chef. And so you can have your hardening cookbook that, that is paired with that. Or module or whatever else you use. And I had a lot of fun doing this as I was in my beginning stages of learning in Test Kitchen because you could really have this nice little sandbox where you're doing... Um, uh, so I actually started on... Uh, started in the reverse order. So I would start with my audit. So I would test, you know, whatever to see if it was in compliant, in compliance. And okay, no, it's not. And so now I'm going to go over to my cookbook and I'm going to do a, a kitchen converge uh, after I remediate it and then see if it's, if it's remediated. And okay, great, it is. Or if it's not, then okay, maybe I did something wrong. So let me do a kitchen login and kind of dig into that, into that vagrant machine and see you know, how I can remediate it manually or whatever. So anyway, this was a great way, this is a great kind of example of the inverted learning that, that um, took place while I was just kind of playing around with Test Kitchen. So anyway, I would encourage you with the person that you're mentoring or apprenticing or whatever to do experiments to find out what motivates them and, and what really gets them excited. Okay, so then though, I ran into a little issue because I started piling up too many things that I was trying to learn. Okay, so imagine column A or board A or whatever you want to call it is the things that you want to learn. And then B are the things that you are currently learning. And then C is the stuff that you've mastered, okay? Um, and I get this concept basically from a lady named Kathy Sierra who does this talk called um, Making Badass Developers. And she talks about this learning style because, or this learning concept, I guess, because if we pile up too much in B, then we're never really going to put anything into C. We're never really going to master anything. And we're just going to be kind of half-assed at everything. And so that's kind of what I had been doing. I had like, I was so excited and so um, like ready to learn all these new things. And I was like, now I'm going to learn Ruby so that I can write custom resources. And now I'm going to, you know, whatever. And then I just kind of stalled out for a little while. And so that's something really super important to remember whenever you're mentoring somebody is to allow them to move things into C because if they don't, then they're gonna get they're gonna start getting really discouraged because they're gonna think that they just can't learn things. And when it's really just because they haven't moved it over into C and mastered it just yet. And so that's why I kind of encourage also like a little bit of specialization. And this doesn't mean that like you should create a bunch of code monkeys that are just you know doing the same thing over and over and over for years on end. A really truly creative and driven person is not going to want to do that for years and years. They're going to want to move more and more things into B and just keep on keep this cycle of A B C going. So anyway, I would just encourage you to think of ways in which they can kind of. Uh, um, move things from B into C by staying on them for just a little while. <clears throat> okay, so now we're looking at June, July. And in July was another really cool way that somebody loaned me their privilege because I was given a diversity scholarship to go to ChefConf by Nathan Harvey. And that opportunity was really, really cool to me because it led to some other things as well. And so, um, so our friend Matt Stratton, who is the host of a podcast called Arrested DevOps, he invited me to be on the podcast that they were taping, or ta nobody says taping anymore, uh, that they were, <laughs> that they were recording while we were there. And um, he said, you know, I want to get somebody's, you know, fresh perspective of chef conf, you know, somebody that's new to it. And I was like, well, I definitely have a fresh new perspective. I don't know what I'm going to talk about, but sure, I'll do it. And so, um, so he loaned me as privilege as well. And that was just really, really cool. 
And while I was there, um, I got to meet this guy who works at who worked at 10th Magnitude. Now he works at Chef. And a week later, I was getting a call from the recruiter at 10th Magnitude because of him. And so one thing led to another. And if if those other people hadn't loaned me their privilege, then I wouldn't have met Trevor, and it wouldn't have led to the job that I'm at right now. So, but anyway, to continue the story, um, I still, so at this point I didn't have the job yet, and this is on August 12th actually, I was in Wisconsin for another conference, and I was, we were with the family actually, and so we were driving from Wisconsin to Chicago, and I told the people at 10th Magnitude, I was like, I'm gonna be in Chicago on Friday. I mean, I can swing by the office if you want. I can meet a couple people, whatever. I mean, just if you want. And so they were, they were like, oh yeah, sure. And so on the drive from Wisconsin to Chicago, I was typing out basically my job description. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna be fully billable for a little while. I realized that. I'm, I'm, I'm still growing, I'm still learning, but these are all of the other ways in which I can contribute to your company and add value. You know, I can, I can blog, I can help with, you know, marketing, I can help with, um, you know, your podcasts or your videos or whatever. You know, I was just thinking of all the different ways in which uh, I could add value. And so I communicated that to them and I, and I did end up going to Chicago that day and I spent all day from, uh, or well, I guess half the day, interviewing with everybody from the recruiter to the CEO. And they were really kind of confused and, and curious about me. And it was kind of a risk for them, right, to hire me. Like, I, I am not your typical cloud automation engineer. And so, and I insisted too, I said, I want a technical job. I don't want to be in marketing. I, I, that's fine for other people, but that's not the, that's not the path that I want to go on. I really want to challenge myself in this way. And so, uh, so they took a chance on me. And on August 25th, it was my kid's first day of school, and where, where all three of them were in school, and my first day back at full-time work in 10 years. And so, uh, so I ask you, what type of person do you want to invest in? What is your team lacking? Does your team all look the same in ideas and philosophy and, and thought and, and how can you loan your platform to somebody else or invest in somebody else so that you can bring about more, um, uh, I hate using the word diversity, but so that you can, you can have a, a more well-rounded team. Okay, so then, now we're looking at September and it was September 15th was our DevOps days in Dallas. Um, and it was so cool because, so this whole time I'm working on DevOps Days Dallas and I'm, uh, I was the sponsor person and so I was earning all of the, I was making all the money for them. But I got to go to DevOps Days Dallas as a 10th Magnitude employee and I was so proud of them. I was so proud to represent them because they were really being sort of a, a leader in uh, doing this kind of crazy thing by hiring me because if you're going to be ahead in the business, if you're going to, I mean, think of DevOps in general. Y'all are doing things that are sort of not the norm. They're advanced thinking. They're, they're cutting edge and all of this. And I feel like 10th Magnitude did the same thing. They did something that was totally out of the box by hiring me. And so I was just really proud to represent them because that was something that, um, that, that suits their character well. So anyway... I would encourage you to think about ways in which you can lower the barrier to te into technology uh, for other people through things like pairing and mentoring. Um, and then think about ways in which whatever you're doing right now in your own companies in which somebody can learn those things in an inverted way, something that's not so typical. And maybe allow for some specialization so that people can move those things from the B column into the C column. And then, of course, ways in which you can lend your platform because, like I said, we all have one in here. Even I have one, and I'm, I'm loaning my platform now to other people in my, in my realm so that they can have the boost that they need. So now I have my own credits, 
And I'm so sad that some of them are cut off at the bottom, but I have my own list of credits of all of the people that have helped me to um, get to where I'm at today. And it's a long list. These are all people who have inspired me in some way or another and who have um, loaned their platform to me and just really been that encouragement in my life. So, and I have my own credit now. I'm on there at the bottom. And if you want to get a hold of me, I'm at Annie Hedgy and my AnnieHedgy.com. And I would love to hear you guys' um, ideas and different things that you can be doing in your own companies because I would love to continue the conversation. But that's all I've got. Thank you.